Well, if, only, if I'm only allowed one, I would say diversify. Diversify, diversify, diversify. Have some stocks, have some bonds, have some different industries in the stock side. Uh, but that's only the beginning. So I have to cheat and give you more than one answer. Number two is look at the quality and the stability of the organization that's offering the funds. You know, there are a lot of fly-by-nights out there. You don't want to have anything to do with them, no matter what the numbers show. Uh, and number three, cost. Cost is really, really important. And here in the U.S., partly because of Vanguard, uh, we've driven costs down quite a bit in the mutual fund industry, maybe by 30 or 40 percent. I, I think common sense, as well as economics, teaches you that unbundling is almost always best. So I'd say unbundled, and certainly that's how Vanguard has gotten where it is today, because our idea was if advisors here are going to charge 1% or 1.5% even, and funds are charging 1.5%, that's just too much. So we have driven the cost on the fund side down to we operate Vanguard at 10 basis points a year. That's a tenth of 1%. My, my research, I've followed this for a long time, is that dividends are an investor's best friend, if you want to look at it that way, or one of his best friends, or her best friend, however one wants to put it. And what I did in my book called The Little Book of Common Sense Investing, and I'm just going to cite some figures from there, is show investors how much dividends contribute to the long-term return on stocks. So if you look, it's amazing, the compounding power of dividends. So dividends are really, I think it's fair to say, in, in many cases, uh, the difference between investment success and investment failure. Yet here and even the U.S., where our costs have come way down as a country, we still see our common stock funds with an average return of maybe, uh, well, let's say growth funds are yielding about 1.6%, and they cost about 1.2%. That doesn't leave but 0.4 tenths of 1% uh, for the investor. And value funds are a little better than that. Uh, the, the yield is about 2.2%. And the expense ratio is about 1.0, and that leaves you know, almost half of the investor. It seems amazing to be bragging about leaving almost half of the income to the investor, but that's the way it is. They just plain consume too much, even in the U.S., consume too much of the fund's dividend income uh, with operating expenses, management fees, and things of that nature. So um, that's where, of course, the index fund comes in. Because when you charge on those two numbers, let's call it an average yield of, of uh, 2%, and the index takes 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0, 0 0.5, the investor is getting 96, 97% of the return. It's a huge difference, and it's crystallized in the difference between indexing, which has its own values and its own shortcomings, and active management. Uh, so the key to the su success, I think, Jeff, in the U.S. of indexing has been the fact that you get your dividends. People aren't really aware of that. And so if you have an advisor uh, who's at least working with an index fund with very low expenses, he can, I think, still add value to his client with typical costs here in the U.S. of around 1% at a 1.5% a year. 1.5% is kind of tough. I don't do a simple age-based formula. If I did, I don't want to tip my hand too much here, Jeff, but if I did, I'd be 90% bonds and 10% stocks, <laughs> and that would be ridiculous at my age and stage. On the other hand, given the health, health issues I've had to overcome with my heart and stuff, one wants to be, at least I want to be, a little more conservative. So right now, and this has been pretty steady over the last seven or eight years, I'm about 50% stocks, almost all index funds, 50% uh, bonds, index fund in my taxable account and uh, in my ta tax-exempt account and municipal bond funds, which are tax-exempt tax here in the U.S., your, your age equals your bond position, is just a rule of thumb and no more than that. No one should take it seriously. Uh, one can think about it as a starting point, uh, although what's happened over time, times have changed, and it used to be bonds yielded much more than the stocks. So as you grew older, you had less of a growth emphasis in your portfolio and more of an income emphasis. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, but today, bonds are yielding maybe 3.5% by my standards. 
some corporates and governments together. And stocks are yielding 1.8. That's more money, but still not a high yielding bond position. So you want to be very careful. As I said in that book, in my book, little book, uh, you also want to talk about your ability, your financial ability to withstand risk and your emotional ability to withstand risk. And those are two very different things. You know, if you have a greater amount of wealth, you can theoretically at least take more of a risk, a little more of a risk because you get super wealthy if you're ever, ever lucky enough to do that, and uh, a little less risk. On the other hand, if you're going to panic when the market goes down a thousand points in three days and get out, that's not going to do you any good at all. In the long run, it is investment return that drives stock prices. It is corporate earnings and corporate dividends. And so the first two elements of my equation are the earnings growth that we have, expect to have in the future. And you could be wildly off on that, but you're pretty confident that in almost all cases, it's not going to be more than 10% a year, and it's not going to be less than zero. So there's a narrow range for, for at least in my predictive um, system. And then you look at the dividend yield. And the dividend yield, again, is very important. Uh, but right now, it's less than 2%. Let's call it 2%. So if we get earnings growth in the future, Jeff, of 4%, 4 let's say, maybe 5 you'd get a 6 or 7% investment return on your securities. And that's what the market will gravitate to in the long run. However, speculative return is the other part. And speculative return is the valuation of your investments. Uh, Take a simple example. If you buy into the stock market when it's 10 times earnings and sell at the end when it's 20 times earnings, that's a 100% increase. And over a decade, that's 7% a year, even more than the, the investment return that I just gave you. So what's to be said about speculative return at this stage of the US market? Uh, and that is, <laughs> I confess, I don't know. <laughs> If the cost of investing through mutual funds, counting portfolio turnover, sales loads, and expense ratios, comes to 2%, and it's actually higher than that, they're going to get in that 7% mark at 5. So it's gross return minus cost equals net return. There's nothing much more fundamental than that. And uh, so when you see that, and then you start compounding, and if you take a look at the long term, and if you compound at 7% for, I think it's 50 years, you end up with $32. And if you compound at 5% at five for 10 years, that would be the market return of 7 less the 2% cost. You end up with $11. Right. $11 versus, I think it's $31. Right. Think of that. Two-thirds of the money has gone because of that seemingly little cost. Right. So it's, it's partly realizing that simple equation which a certain party has been saying for more years than he cares to count. <laughs> uh, but it's also looking more at the long term. There's so much noise in a given year. You know, a fund with a 2% cost uh, it has a great performance year, and it goes up 15% in the 7% market. Right. So the naysayers say, see that? Funds, funds, <laughs> this fund beats the index fund. It's a very shallow argument. Because the most important thing everybody should realize is per past performance does not repeat. When you talk about uh, inefficient markets, where you talk about a stock picker's market, there's no such thing as a stock picker's market. Because if you're a good stock picker, there has to be somewhere out there a bad stock picker. Because all of you together are average. And the same thing, if, if, if it is true, that market's getting uh, more efficient, make it difficult, or, or if they get less efficient, it'll be easier for managers to win. Uh, that's not so. It will be easier, theoretically at least, for a good manager to win by more. But if a good manager can outperform the S&P by 3% a year, there's another manager that's going to underperform the S&P by 3% a year in this simple argument. And then when you take their costs out, the 3% the manager wins by one, and the minus 3% manager loses by five. These are not the best of all odds. So it's a, it's a matter of logic. Uh, I might even say it's a tautological issue. 
feel a little bit better about ETFs, but not all exchange traded funds. I mean, if somebody wants to buy the Vanguard S&P 500 standard fund, traditional index fund, or the Vanguard ETF 500, as long as he promises not to trade the latter, right. he's gonna, they're both going to be the same return. Right. So it's too much trading, and the trading in, in ETFs is extremely high. And then there are the junk ETFs. Uh, you, know, you can buy if you want to. I don't recommend it. Uh, an exchange-traded fund that will give you four times leverage when the market goes up. But if you think it's going down, it will also give you four times leverage when the market's going down. If you know when the market is going up and you know when it's going down, you're going to be a very rich person. 